Welcome to all of you uh, this evening. Uh, this is uh, the topic this evening, Decisions at the End of Life, uh, is a particularly lively and relevant one in Canadian society today. We have a dramatic case that uh, was decided in, in favor of uh, Gloria Taylor and Lee Carter in British Columbia, the trial judge said to Gloria Taylor, who, who has ALS, who had ALS, she, she's since died, that she was entitled to assistance in ending her own life. The British Columbia Court of Appeal just recently overturned that decision, not, not because they said it was wrong, but because they said uh, that they were bound by the Supreme Court decision in the Sue Rodriguez case 20 years ago, another British Columbia ALS patient. And, and so if the decision, if the ruling's going to be changed, it's got to be changed by the Supreme Court itself, and, and there will be almost certainly an appeal to the Supreme Court. So that case will be coming to trial. And meanwhile, from out east, as probably all of you know, the province of Quebec has passed legislation. The criminal code in Canada is, as some of but maybe possibly not all of you will know, the criminal code in Canada is, uh, is federal. No, in the states, it's, each state has its own differing criminal code. And uh, assisted suicide, <clears throat> whether by a doctor or a loved one or a friend, is therefore a criminal offense punishable by up to 14 years in prison in every province in Canada. But health care is a provincial responsibility, and the government of Quebec can't change the criminal code, but what they can do is they can say that... Uh, uh, hastening the death of a patient at that patient's request, uh, subject to various safeguards, uh, is part of health care and therefore part of our provincial responsibility. And they can instruct uh, the uh, Crown prosecutors to exercise the discretion not to bring charges. Now, they will pass this legislation very soon and it too will be challenged. So the Supreme Court is going to get at least two kicks at the cat. Uh, perhaps I should say kicks at the can. Uh, on this issue. And meanwhile, I think aside from legal issues, there there's a lot of concern, a lot of discussion that over the dinner table with an aging population. Many people have quite strong views. And uh, so it's a very live issue in Canada today. Not just physician-assisted suicide or, or mercy killing, but also terminal sedation and withholding and withdrawal of medical care and uh, palliative care. And we've had a Royal Commission report, just for, the Royal Society of Canada, uh, sorry, has just recently come out in favor of legalizing uh, physician-assisted suicide and uh, mercy killing in Canada, subject to careful restrictions and safeguards and regulations. So, that's our topic tonight, uh, the whole range of uh, end-of-life options. Uh, we have uh, three distinguished guests, uh, all from uh, the University of Manitoba, though in the case of Peter Marcus, then it was a few years ago uh, that he was a professor of uh, pathology and forensic pathology at the, at the U of M. Uh, my other two colleagues uh, are currently uh, academics at the University of Manitoba, and I'll, I'll introduce each of them in turn. Uh, each has agreed to uh, speak for about eight to ten minutes in their initial presentation. If they go over, a trap door will open and they'll be swallowed up into the basement, uh, never to be seen or heard again. Uh, so we'll take about 30 minutes for, for you to get three different perspectives. The perspective of a, of a physician, the perspective of a farina gerontologist, was that? <laughs> and uh, and Mary immediately to my left is uh, is is a lawyer who specializes in uh, biomedical law. I'm not going to give uh, extensive. Indeed, I'm not going to really give any introduction because you've got their biographies in front of you, and I'm presuming that we're all literate. So uh, uh, I'm going to uh, ask each of them in turn. And uh, Farina. <laughs> so anxious about pronouncing her first name uh, and I was a little bit anxious about her last name too, Manic. How, how am I doing? Do I get a B plus? Yeah, yeah. B plus. <laughs> hey, I, I was worried about a D or an F. <laughs> uh, Farina will, will, uh, will speak first and uh, uh, perhaps I might just begin by asking you uh, 
Canadian public opinion for, for about f at least 15 years has, has been very solidly in favor of law reform. And uh, What do you think? Uh, is, is it time for a change? Is reform in the air? I've, I've given uh, dozens of lectures to senior citizens and I've never had an, an old person one may say old person. I've never had anyone express anxiety that they'll be bumped off too soon. But lots have expressed anxiety uh, that it would be a curse to live too long and that they might not, that they might die very badly. Uh, what do you hear? Where would you like to hear more? Am I, am I on? Yeah, okay. Um, in terms of the polls, I guess, it varies actually a lot in terms of what uh, what people say about about assisted suicide. It, it ranges. You look at the literature anywhere from as low as thirty percent to eighty percent, right? So it really depends on who you ask, and I think that's what you're getting at. It depends on who you ask, and the the the, the dialogue can get extremely. Uh, diverse depending on religious backgrounds and I'm sure you've experienced that there's personal perspectives there's age perspectives so so depending on who you ask makes a big difference so what do people believe well it kind of depends on who you ask and it also depends on when you ask people are they closer towards death or further away from death so I don't think it's quite as simple as that so Okay, now I can go into my thing. Okay. You've already started. I've started, <laughs> yes, yes, I have. Uh, but uh, like Arthur said, I, I'm, uh, I'm in aging, so my perspective to this comes from an, from an aging perspective. So, so you can look at it from ethical issues, and legal issues, and disability perspectives, and many different perspectives, and I come from aging. Just to set the stage then, and again, Arthur already alluded to that, he's basically already said everything in his intro, but we have an aging population, and I'm sure you're aware of that, and when you look at the numbers, the number of seniors in Canada will go from 5 million currently up to 10 million in about less than 15 years, and that's because of the baby boomers. And as the baby boomers are aging, and as the baby boomers, and that's a very large group of people born between 1946 uh, and 64, as they are aging, as their parents are aging, as they see their parents die, they will, I think, make changes happen. They are always have, they've always had an impact. Whenever they've had, whenever that group has come through society, they have changed what we do. So I'm expecting that the dialogue around aging and assisted suicide is absolutely not going to go away, it's going to get stronger. So that's the context in terms of an aging perspective. Um, I didn't want to make three points until uh, Arthur sh cuts me off here. So the first point I wanted to make is that from an aging field um, perspective, uh, the concern has been raised that there may be some societal pressures for people not to want to be a burden. Um, when you ask seniors, a lot of them are very much afraid of losing independence, of being a burden on their family, on society. And when you look at societal perspectives, you see actually quite a lot of negativity against older adults. You see it reflected in the media in terms of presentations of uh, that older cohort as the, the great tsunami, the apocalyptic demography, these vivid terms that are really quite negative. Um, so the idea being that this, this ageism that is, is in our society might actually force pressure, and this would be unconsciously, not so much consciously, but unconsciously, uh, pressure people into wanting to end their lives or maybe families into uh, making decisions on their behalf. So that's a concern that has been raised. Um, I think the ageism concern is legitimate. It's very, I think we need to address it, tackle it. However, I still think we need to talk about assisted suicide. We can't just say, well, there's ageism. Let's just direct the discussion towards that issue now and away from assisted suicide, euthanasia, end of life issues. The second point I wanted to make is that sometimes the discussion around dying gets redirected into healthcare issues. So the argument goes that 
if only we had better health care at the end of life, then people would not want to or would not need to ask for assisted suicide or euthanasia. So again, I, I understand that argument. I think we have a long ways to go in terms of end-of-life health care. There's a lot being done in terms of palliative, and that's very positive. Still, we have a ways to go from that perspective. And as in the ageism argument, I think we still need to be careful in, in saying, yes, we need to work on improving health care, but at the same time, we still need to talk about, about the right to die. So one does not divert us from the other argument. And I think the, uh, the example of recently of uh, Dr. Daniel Lowe, who made a video before he died, is a very good example. So the, the media he was presented as the SARS doctor. He uh, quite clearly said he had excellent palliative care. He was very well cared for, yet he still asked or felt that he could have benefited from assisted suicide. So the healthcare argument is out there, and I think we need to focus on it, but not entirely take away from the argument of assisted suicide, euthanasia, whatever you want to talk about. So my third point I want to make is, is a really broader one. And I think in our society, we're remarkably reluctant to talk about dying in general. Uh, death has been um, medicalized, it's been marginalized, it's not something that happens within a family and a home anymore. There's a trend towards that again with palliative care, but still it is very much still disease oriented and we're a society, and from a research perspective, we want to get rid of diseases, right? We want to eliminate all the diseases. When you look at the top causes of death, cancer, heart disease, we're very hard trying to find cures for them. We don't want to die of those things. We don't want to die of diabetes. We don't want to die of stroke. And that's all good, but ultimately we have to die of something. And I think we lose sight of that. And we lose sight of the fact that before the first death, there will be a decline. Sometimes it's short, but very few people will be very, very healthy, and then one day they will go to bed and simply not wake up. So that decline will happen and we need to recognize it and sometimes the decline can be severe, it can be prolonged. And it can involve dementia. How many of you in this room have been affected by dementia, have had somebody, family, who's had dementia? Right, lots of hands. <coughs> There's a slow progressive decline, not being able to get out of bed, not being able to eat, not being able to communicate, talk, recognize family. So my point is, we need to talk about dying. Assisted suicide, euthanasia is part of that dialogue, but it's broader than that. It has to do with advanced uh, care directives, wills, dealing with family issues before we get to that final point when maybe it's really <coughs> we're, we're at the very end. So, so my three points are really point is we need to talk about dying and part of dying is we need to talk about assisted suicide.